Well, I think my, I don't know, it was my great grandfather or grandfather moved down from Pennsylvania actually to the other side of Cardova and then then moved to the next farm behind this one. Um, I think it was my great grandfather, but and the story was that he had five daughters and it, he was in a, in a coal mining town and he didn't want them to marry coal miners, so he moved, moved away. Oh, Basically what, what I know is my grandfather, and I never knew my grandfather, but he lived on the, the next farm back. He, was, he died before I was born and I, my, I always heard that he was kicked by a horse and died. Oh. My older brother Richard said he never heard that story, so I don't <laughs> no. know. But he, he, he lived in the next farm back, and that's where my father grew up. And then in the Depression, the banks come to him and asked him to buy this farm for whatever he could pay for it. Oh, wow. He didn't have a price on it, and everything was so bad at that point in time. And my father and my uncle were farming together at that point in time, and he, he told the bank, he didn't tell the bank anything at first until he, uh, he went home and talked to my father and uncle and said if they would tell it, he would buy it. So, yeah. so he did, and then later on my father bought it from him, and my uncle went and bought a farm down uh, in Long Woods area. I have five brothers, and all of us grew up in this house here. A couple of them were actually born at Ridgely. My father uh, lived up there when he married my mother and, and worked with my grandfather up there. But, but all five of us lived here. All five of us lived within a half mile of the, of the home farm here. All five of us farmed together. All of us were given the opportunity to go to college and do whatever we wanted to do. Just, there was no pressure on us, no expectations for us to farm. They hmm. said, if you want to, we'll try to make an opportunity for you, but you know, you get your education and go do what you want. Yeah. I knew from about the time I was probably 12 or so that I wanted to farm. Yeah. And it's a challenge. <laughs> it's, it's the challenge of every year um, being different. You do the same thing, but you got different weather conditions. You got new things you learn, um, and the you know the old A Team TV show when they come to the end of they said, you know it's really great when the plan comes together. Well, at the end of the year when the plan comes together, it's just a great great feeling um, that you know you're able to put all these pieces together. Yeah. But it's really there's there's just a real tie to the land. You you either got to have a real commitment to animals or the, or the land, I think, and just always felt connected to the land. It's a lot of things. It's, you know, it's being outside. It's doing a job that at the end of the day you turn around and you see what you've done. Um, there's a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment even, you know, almost daily and then particularly at the end of a year when when things come together, if you have a good year and you try new things and you and you set a record yield, you know that's that's just a real sense of satisfaction. You know, I got pissed off in September of 2015 when the environmental community wanted to put on a moratorium for chicken houses, and I'd been thinking for a long time that we needed that we were doing most of the things that we could as far as best management practices and farmers had done things to clean up the bay. So I sat down one day and listed out things and come up with 38 things that farmers have done in my farming career that should increase water quality. And there were two things that pissed me off. One was the moratorium on the chicken houses and the second was I kept hearing that the chop tank was the most polluted river on on Delmarva. Well, all but one of my farms is in the chop tank watershed, so kind of take it a little bit personal. <laughs> and my question was, here, here we're doing these, these 38 things. If it's not cleaning up, why isn't it cleaning up? And if it's not cleaning up, and you want me to do something else, why in the hell should I do something else? And I passed that list around to environmentalists and other farmers and come up with 43 things. I said, tell me whether whether you think it's right or, or not right, whether I need to take it off or whether I should add something. I ended up with 43 things. 
I was on the Center for Agroecology at that point in time. I went to Russ and Sarah and said, look, here's my list. If the chop tank's not cleaning up, why isn't it? I said, would you get a few people together to answer this question for me? Well, they picked up on it, and, you know, I thought it would be two or three people, but they decided to have a whole day symposium on the, the, the chop tank. You know, the, the bay has cleaned up somewhat, the rivers still aren't, but I still, still believe that's legacy stuff that we did 20, 30 years ago and, you know, have changed. And, mm -hmm. uh, that one, that one must have really got me because that was the middle of, of September and the end of September I had a heart attack and had triple bypass surgery, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it wasn't that, there was a lot of other, a lot of other things to stress, but I said, what am I going to go to the doctor and say, I'm a 65 year old man, I'm working a 70 hour week and I'm tired, <laughs> you know, I so we don't give you much work on. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor apologized to me later and says, I missed something. I said, no, you didn't miss nothing. You asked the right questions, and I didn't lie to you.